My earliest memories of playing Pokemon involved me basically steamrolling through the entirety of Pokemon Gold using only my overlevel Typhlosion. Armed with Ember, Flame Wheel, Flamethrower, and Fire Blast. It worked out for me back then, but now as an adult, I've come to realize how important coverage moves are, so I thought I'd rectify the mistakes of my youth by banning all stab moves. You already know the rules of a hardcore Nuzlocke, but to summarize, if a Pokemon faints, it's no longer usable. I can't use items in battle, but held items are fine. I can't overlevel past next gem leader's highest leveled Pokemon, and I can't use any moves affected by stab. For those who don't know what stab is, it's the acronym for same type attack bonus. As the name suggests, it's a 50% boost for attacks that have the same type as the Pokemon using it. Removing stab moves really changes up the dynamic more than you'd think. Typically you would bring Pokemon that have the type advantage over a gym leader, and they would typically be able to take it, as well as deal super effective damage. But now, not only do you have to pick Pokemon that can actually take it, but you have to hope that they have the coverage to actually deal damage. And more often than not, you'll have to pick one over the other. Gen 5 is the quintessential example of this, as well as this generation is possibly my biggest roster of favorite Pokemon. Man, loads of these Pokemon have really bad coverage. And in Pokemon Black, we can only use Gen 5 Pokemon. And we immediately see this with our first Pokemon. As tradition, I pick the starter that will make the run harder for us, and as tradition, sadly this ends up being the grass starter. And the Snivy line gets absolutely no coverage moves whatsoever. Aside from grass moves, it only learns normal type moves by level up. Every Pokemon gets normal type moves. Actually, for the future, whenever I talk about coverage, always assume that they at least get normal type moves since 99% of Pokemon do. So whenever I say something like XYZ has no coverage, I mean it gets no coverage except for normal moves. Saves me needing to constantly clarify myself. The superior line in Gen 5 is astonishingly bad, getting very few tools to actually use throughout a standard run, while having really mediocre stats and a bad typing. Grass types usually at least get some pretty good status moves for support, but the best slash only one Snivy gets by level up is Leech Seed. Its TM learn set is honestly not much better. In my opinion, it really is the worst starter introduced in the game, even worse than Meganium. Viability wise, I don't really mind its design. Also for you nerds, I am aware of its hidden ability Contrary plus Leaf Storm strats, but A, that's a late game grass move coming off a 75 base special attack, it really isn't that good, and B, when during a standard playthrough are you able to get a starter with a hidden ability? Wasn't expecting to rant about the starter this early on, but considering we only get 3 more encounters before the first gym, its disadvantages really show as its best move will be tackle for a sizable portion of the first half. Thankfully our other Pokemon aren't too bad as the two that we catch are Lillipup and Patras. Now despite Pokemon Black and White being a mirror to Red and Blue, not many Pokemon this generation get a gen 1 moveset, so these early game normal Pokemon unfortunately don't learn many elemental moves like their predecessors, only Pokemon where it's strange seeing a rodent who can't summon thunderstorms at will. But at the very least, both of them get bite fairly early on, so at least we have one move that we can use. The next Pokemon that we get is a gift panpool from the dream yard. The first gym in this game rotates the type of its Pokemon depending on your starter, always being super effective against it. So this gift Pokemon is a way for 8 year olds to not get walled by the first challenge in the game. Now as you can tell, this this challenge kind of defeats the purpose of this mechanic as we can't use Tal's stab water moves, but that doesn't make him useless. While we can't use his super effective moves, we can still make use of his resistance to fire. While Crest is only the first gym leader, he isn't a pushover as both of his Pokemon get the move work up, which raises both attack and special attack. And if we let him use this enough times, they could sweep or at the very least take some mons down with them. I start off with Pool Noodle as he won't really be too useful for the next mon, and all we can really do is spam tackle, hoping Lillipop doesn't use too many workups. Luckily we get a crit turn 1 and Lillipop just sticks to using bite. We can't do enough damage for a kill, so Crest uses a potion, meaning after getting crit ourselves, Noodle can't win the 1 on 1. Into Pillow on another bite, and we can now speed with our own to finish Lillipop off. But next up is Panzer, who gets the stab move incinerate, which also burns our berry. I want insurance in case it gets off too many boosts, so I opt for a sand attack to lower its accuracy as it goes straight for a workup. It uses one more, okay getting kinda concerning, so I use another sand attack. Into Towel, as Panzer uses another. Lick is weaker, but a fish for a paralysis chance, which we get turn 1. And Panzer, please stop. I use a couple of layers to lower its defense, luckily managing to avoid getting hit for 2 more turns, but a single attack could kill now. Fury Swipes manages to get Panzer below half HP, and Panzer uses the final workup, now maxing out its attack. Towel is still far too valuable, so I switch into Pillow as Panzer uses his first attack, which Pillow survives on just 3 HP. What was even the point behind all those boosts? With the two defense drops, a single bite can finish Panzer off, getting us the first badge. 
I think I was a little bit too worried about the boosts, but as you can tell, not having stab moves turned this battle into an actual threat, whereas in the standard run, it's basically a non-issue thanks to the free elemental monkey. So moving on, I actually decided to skip our next encounter on Route 3 as the encounter quality is pretty bad. Blittle only gets the fire move flame charge through level up, Purloin only normal moves, and the most common, Pidove in black and white, gets literally no coverage moves at all, not even through TMs, the only non-normal or flying move it learns being U-turn, which you don't even get until the post game. Thankfully in Wellspring Cave, we land the coin flip to get a rock and roller, as while it's not great now, Gigalith could be a game changer. Also Blanket has a decent type advantage against the next gym. Here we can also get the TM for Thief, a weak dial type move in this generation, but allows us to steal berries of Wild Ordino. Lenora is usually considered to be an early game run ender, and can be a roadblock for many challenge runs. Her normal Pokemon get many strong stab moves at this stage in the game, and even her Watchdog gets hypnosis, which with it being pretty fast early on is really annoying to play around. Herdia has the move takedown, but we're able to play around this fairly easily. We start off with confusing her, and then switching to Pool Noodle to get off the move Lead Seed, which drains a percentage of HP every turn. While this is a grass move, it isn't affected by the stab boost, so it's fair game. Then we can switch into our own Herdia, Mattress, who thankfully landed the coin flip to get the ability Intimidate, which lowers the opponent's attack on switching. And then we can just spam Bite and recover back a portion of HP every turn until Herdia goes down. Next is Watchog, and this Pokemon is dangerous. It has Retaliate, a 70 BP move, which doubles in power if an ally fainted the previous turn. Turn. This with stab could nuke almost any Pokemon that we have at this stage in the game. But luckily we got Blankus, who resists normal moves, as Watchog puts him to sleep anyway. Great. Well at least Retaliate loses the boost so we can switch out to Mattress to lower her attack on the crunch. Retaliate still does a lot of damage, and I use a layer to lower its defense. We have to switch out, so it's our own Watchog, Pillow, who tanks. We're the faster of the two, so confuse Watchog, who still pushes past use Leer. Crunch does just under half, but then lowers her defense. Despite Watchog breaking through confusion, she throws using another Leer, meaning we can outspeed the next turn using another Crunch to finish her off, getting us the second badge. Okay, I mean, look, being overprepared is always better than being underprepared. This very easily could have been a situation where she put half of my monsters to sleep before we could do anything. But unfortunately, the next gym will actually be a struggle for us, as the moves bug types are weak to are typically not learned by Pokemon outside of those types, and we're not getting any fire, flying, or rock type TMs for a while, and our upcoming encounters aren't exactly well equipped for this gym. Next up is Berg, who has the fully evolved ace Leveny. Leveny is not only quite strong this early on, but none of our Pokemon resist bug moves, and it gets the move Razor Leaf, which has a high crit chance, which in this generation does double the damage. The only Pokemon that we have that resists grass is Servine, who's weak to bug anyway, and we only have access to two new encounters from a pool of Pokemon that don't exactly help us. Our next encounter is in the Pinwheel Forest. Now I already did catch Timpol earlier, but like many others, I play with the Pinwheel Claws, where I count the inner pinwheel forest as a separate encounter. Both Cotsney and Seawaddle get almost no coverage via level up and are both grass types, weak to bug types and we've already spoken about Pidove. Venipede is actually quite decent for us, not because it gets good moves, but it both resists bug and quadruply resists grass. Unfortunately, it's only a 15% chance, and I don't really want to risk the 85% to get a bad Pokemon, so we do something a little different. Back to Route 2, where we initially skipped an encounter, I now decide to wait for a Shaking Grass encounter, which will always give us an Ordino here. Now, Ordino isn't great, but it has pretty decent stats for this early in the game, and it's one of the few Pokemon that get a Gen 1 moveset, getting moves that allow to bend the laws of nature, However, one of the big changes made in Gen 5 from Gen 4 is that TMs now have unlimited use. Sounds great, right? It is. But unfortunately for us, the downside of this is that many good TMs are locked until either very late into the game or straight up the post game. This includes a very large portion of moves that would have made Ordino viable, such as the likes of Flamethrower, Thunderbolt, Psychic, etc. Obviously not good for Nuzlocks. In fact, the only attacking move Ordino can learn before the next gym is Grass Knot, which we'll get in the Pinmore Forest. Not great for a bug gym. But we catch Ordino here since now because of the dupes clause we can manipulate Shaken Grass encounters to get the much rarer encounters, as future Ordinos won't be allowed. And we immediately use this for our Pinwheel Forest encounter where we can get another elemental monkey, which surprisingly is not something many people know. There is a 5% chance for us to land Whimsicott, which while being fully evolved is something that we really do not want. It has really bad coverage, and it doesn't even get the good support moves that its pre-evo Cottony gets as it's a stone evo. And in the 
the early Pokemon games. Stone Evo Pokemon don't get access to the moves that their pre-Evos learn by level up, and tend to get very few to no level up moves themselves. It took until Generation 8 for them to change this. After about 10 minutes of grinding, we finally land a Pokemon that we don't have, which ends up being Pansage. Which, don't get me wrong, is a much better grass type than Servine, but shares the exact same problems for the next gym. So that was a big waste of time. Burglies with Whirlipede, and I sent out Pool Noodle. This Pokemon's not going to be useful for most of the battle, so we may as well start with it. I immediately set up a Leech Seed, as our defenses are lowered by Screech. Perfect for us, as we immediately switch out to Blanket on the resisted Poison Tail. Damage which we recover back with Leech Seed. And now all I want to do is spam Iron Defense, doubling our defense as the Leech Seed saps away at Whirlipede. It even wastes a turn using Screech, which is cancelled out. And a wasted turn is only bad for him. It switches into using Struggle Bugs, which isn't affected by our defense boost, but at least we recover some HP each turn. But then it gets a crit on the second one, forcing us to use our berry early. See, the idea behind what I was trying to do was that eventually when Whirlipede goes down after we've maxed out our defenses, having Rock and Roller out would bait Leave any early with a grass move raise the leaf. But now when it finally does come out, we're already at low health without our berry. Well, we've already put in this much work, so I stay in regardless, as I fail to realize that would have just gone for a struggle bug anyway. Which blanket survives. Headbutt doesn't do too much, so we need to switch. Into Mattress, who lowers Levenee's attack, as it does use a raised leaf this time. Not critting. Since Mattress eats fairly well, I stay into lower its defense with a Leer on another raised leaf, recovering back some HP with the berry. Next into Watch, I'm gonna fail to protect, and we're somehow able to outspeed to use Confuse Ray. It doesn't work out this turn as we get hit by String Shot, making us slower, and then Levenee snaps out the next turn as it uses Protect. Razor Leaf still doesn't see a crit, and Crunch actually does quite a bit, but not enough for another hit to kill. I try to confuse Leaveny instead, and it hits itself the next turn, another crunch finishing it off. That was honestly the Pokemon I was most scared of, and we made it through with no deaths. But we still have Dwebble left, and my best Pokemon have already taken some damage, having used up their berries. It's fairly defensive, and I don't see Crunch doing too much, so I use a Super Fang instead, which always does half to the opponent's current HP. This is a normal move, but it does set damage, meaning it's not affected by Stab. Berg wastes a turn using Sand Attack, negated by Pillow's ability. Honestly, that was the first time I've seen a trigger. Crunch wasn't quite enough for a kill, so Berg uses a Hyper Potion. Why does he have one this early? Dwebble's damage output is quite bad, so we can just whistle it down again until Berg uses another Hyper Potion. It's only the third gym. God, I'm glad we didn't have to deal with this against Levany. Pillow can stay in long enough to bring it below half again, and then we can bring out Mattress to clean up, and that's the third badge. Looking back, if Levany didn't hit itself, that battle could have easily turned sour as Berg would have had two free heals on it, and I'm sure that would have been enough time for it to land a crit. And even moving on, our battles aren't going to get much easier. Our next gym battle is against the Lesser, who uses fast electric Pokemon, two of whom are immune to ground, and all of which have the annoying move Volt Switch, which does a lot of damage and gives her a free switch. But first is the rival battle, which I tend to forget about. I haven't mentioned rival battles yet, as they haven't really been tough, but with Sharon's Pokemon evolving, he can actually be a bit of a challenge. Pidov and Pansage go down easily thanks to Pillow's crunches, but Pignard is a pretty annoying Pokemon for us to deal with, as Fire and Fighting is a combination that can hit all of my Pokemon, with us having no super effective moves for it. It even has Flame Charge, raising its speed each turn it uses it. I switch into Mattress to lower its attack, and while it does have the super effective Arm Thrust, with this low damage output and the attack drop, we should be fine. Instead, it uses Defense Cards, I try to lower its defense with Leer. This happens again. And then the third time, I decided to switch out to Noodle to set up a Leech Seed as it finally uses another Flame Charge, which we eat. Back into Mattress for another attack drop as for some reason it switched back to using Defense Curl. It continued to be locked in so I stuck to using Leer to keep him in the loop, but now with Sandstorm and Leech Seed chipping at each turn, while we just recover back our HP. Eventually using a Bite which did just enough damage for the Sandstorm plus Leech Seed damage to finish Pignite off. I honestly couldn't tell you what happened there. Like by the second time I brought Herdia back out, Pignite was at plus 2 defense. It it really shouldn't have had any reason to keep using defense curls, but if I can get an easy win against a Pokemon that had an overwhelming advantage over us, I'm not going to complain. Luckily before we get to Nimbasa City, we have to go through Route 4 which is a beautiful route in this game, especially for this challenge. We have access to 4 new encounters from a pool of very good Pokemon, one of which being a fossil which we can choose. I actually did get my Route 4 encounter earlier, but it was a Sandal who's both weed to grass and bug so I didn't really think it was worth mentioning at the time, but I cannot explain how much I adore the Crocodile line. It's always such a useful encounter, and in this challenge it can learn so many moves through TMs. It does have a minus attacking nature, meaning it can't really reach its full potential,
potential, but in Nuzlocke's natures aren't that important. Unlike in competitive formats where using Pokemon that are level 50 or 100, in Nuzlocke the average level is quite lower. Usually the affected stat is increased or decreased by about 10 to 15 points at most. Sandal did get the ability Moxie though, which increases attack by one stage every time it faints a Pokemon. Then we can get a Darumaka in the Desert Resort, we're forced to get your mask in the Relic Castle, and then I accidentally ended up picking the Plume Fossil which will end up being Tortuga. I don't think I'll really be using the fossils anyway. But the encounters aren't even the best part. Here we can get the free TM for Dig, a base 80 power ground move which can be learned by a massive pool of Pokemon, and even Rock Tomb, a base 50 power rock move that can be learned by a massive pool of Pokemon. It does have a god awful accuracy of 80% though for whatever reason. Imagine making this move as accurate as Stone Edge. In both moves which are super effective against the lesser's Pokemon, but they're not even the best TMs that we can get before her. In Nabasa City, we can buy the TM for Return, and this TM is possibly the single best move that we can learn this run. Return is a normal type move that almost every Pokemon can learn, and the amount of damage Return does is based on the Pokemon's friendship level, going all the way up to 102 base power. And friendship is a free resource. You can max it out by biking back and forth with speed up for about 20 minutes, with no risk to your Pokemon. So now, all of our non-normal physical attackers get a free 102 base power move. And with the new level cap, Blanket can evolve into Baldur, and by me trading with my friends, we can evolve him straight into a Gigalith, who can now make full use of this with a base 135 attack stat. It actually just tears through all of the gym trainers, though it does have to take attacks every turn with that abysmal speed. Alyssa leads with her first of two Emolga, and as we know it's just gonna Volt Switch around, we can start spreading Super Fangs with Pillow. Volt Switch didn't do too much, so we can stay in for another, recovering back some HP with our berry, and then hit another Super Fang. Unfortunately, we already get paralyzed by Molga's ability static, but it's not like we were outspeeding any of her mons anyway. I don't see Zepstrucker coming out on the next Volt Switch, and since we need to switch out ourselves anyway, I confuse it to begin positioning. Into Blanket as Emolga hits itself. While bulky, its special defense is lacking, so we take a fair bit from Volt Switch, but it returns able to finish off the incoming Emolga, and we immediately get paralyzed. Why am I so unlucky? Well, with the other Emolga coming out, this means that we can get a free attack off on the Aesop Striker. Doing well over half is about time. Blanket's physical defense is a lot better, so we can stay in on the spark and hit back with another return, finishing off Alessa's ace. And now we can get a free switch into Socks the Sandal on the ineffective Volt Switch, tank an aerial ace, and then finish off the third Mon with return. Are you serious? I mean, it doesn't matter now, but that's three times in a row that's static triggered. And that's Alessa. Honestly, she's usually one of the gym leaders that typically gives me a lot of trouble, but I guess if you specifically play with the Volt Switch in mind, she can be dealt with a lot easier. But with our fourth badge, we can move on to the second half of the game. We have a few new encounters before our next gym battle, but none of the Pokemon that we catch will really help us out with Clay, and the only TM that we get is Scald, which while is a water type move strong against ground, isn't really one that's learned by many non-water types. Only three in fact, Azuril who evolves into a water type, Stunfisk who's a water based Pokemon, and Embor for reasons. So we're fighting Clay with no new tools to our arsenal. Clay leads with Crocorock, so we lead with our own. Socks would have been great with his ability Moxie, but unfortunately while I did downplay the effects of natures, I'm proven slightly wrong as she lands a crit, just missing a kill. Crocorock uses a bulldoze, not doing much but lowering our speed. It's in range for a heal, so we use another return, which does just over half. I guess it was a roll. Now Crocorock outspeeds, but uses Swagger, sharply raising our attack, but confusing us. Socks pulls through anyway, finishing Crocorock off with another return. This also gives us an attack boost with Moxie. Now it's very sad losing our three attack boosts, but if we hit ourselves, Socks will die. So into Pan Siege on Palpatode's Muddy Water. How does this thing outspeed a monkey? We set up a lead seed, and since we resist all of Palpatode's attacks, we can just spam return. Aqua Ring just keeps Palp barely alive, triggering the Hyper Potion, so this goes on longer than necessary. Eventually, we get a crit, and Palp goes down. Excadrill is a very scary Pokemon with its enormous attacking stat, and with us still having no fully evolved Pokemon. I don't really want Excadrill getting a free turn to set up, so I stay in as it uses Rock Slide instead. Which Broccoli survives, and then we land a lead seed, making this a lot easier. Honestly, Honestly, I was ready to sack Broccoli here, but with the seed up, I switch into Mattress to lower its attack. We eat the next slash, and even recover back most of the damage with Lead Seed thanks to Exodraw's high base HP. Now we can just keep using Dig, which will also waste an extra turn to sap more health from Excar, or just get a crit and take him down in one turn. I got a crit against each of Clay's Pokemon, and that's our fifth badge. 
Excadrill is a pretty scary Pokemon, but with a Mon with Intimidate, it's a lot easier to control. The passive damage from Lead Seed also really helps out with defensive Mons. We can move right on, as there isn't really much keeping us here. The encounter quality for these next two sections is quite bad. The Pokemon in Charge Stone Cave, despite not really being that bad or anything, don't get any real coverage moves, except for the Tynamo line, but that's like a 2% chance. So instead, we use this cave as an opportunity to get a fantastic encounter. One that's guaranteed in literally every cave. Similar to Shaking Grass, in caves there's a chance for a dust cloud to form, and running into these either gives you an item or triggers an encounter, the most common of which being Drawba. This means that we can get an Excadrill of our own, a steel ground Pokemon with a base attacking stat of 135. It even learns Hone Claws right off the bat which increases attack and even gets Swords Dance via level up which doubles its attack. Its defense stats are pretty bad but it has a large base HP which more than makes up for it. Having an encounter like this being guaranteed is insane. And honestly, we don't really need anything else for the next gym. Skylar uses flying Pokemon, and her Swoobat has nothing to hit steel types. It is faster, but we can safely set up two Hone Claws. It even uses Amnesia, which bumps its special defense. Twice. Not too helpful against a physical attacker. Hone Claws also raises accuracy, so we land a super effective rock slide, picking up the one shot. Next is Swarna, and while she is a water type, we're still pretty healthy, so I stay in, as she uses an Aqua Ring anyway. Rock slide. And we've already spoken about how useless the unpheasant line is. Rock slide. Soap is gonna tear this game apart. She even runs through Sharon with just return. Even Pig Knight didn't really get a chance to hit her. Though I did almost mess up by underestimating how much a seed bomb from Semi Sage would do after a leer. Anyway, we get Surf, and that means we get another game changing encounter. Going back to the route before Charge Stone Cave, we can surf across the stream to enter the cave where you can catch the legendary Pokemon Cobalion. Well, even if I did use legendaries, this is not even the best Pokemon in this cave. Since we were lucky enough to get a Boldor earlier, we can level up one of our Pokemon to level. 31, then use a repel. This filters out the other encounters that we didn't get, Woo Bad, which then means that the only Pokemon valid is Axew, one of my favorite dragon type lines. This Pokemon, once evolved into Haxorus, hits hard and has great coverage. Though because of the level cap, it can't fully evolve until after the final gym. Speaking of coverage, before challenging the next gym, we get two more amazing TMs. The first being Shadow Claw, a physical ghost move with a base power of 70, one that a lot of physical attackers can learn. And Brick Break, a fighting type move with a base power of 75, another one a lot of physical attackers can learn. Yeah, special attackers get kinda screwed over in this game when it comes to TMs, a contrast to my last challenge in Platinum. In Icarus City, we can buy the TMs for Fire Blast, Blizzard, and Thunder, but with their low accuracies, I don't really want to rely on them. Bryson's a joke anyway. Brick Break one shots the Ice Cream, Brick Break two shots Bear Tick and Brick Break one-shots the Snowflake unable to find love. We have a Team Plasma section, but that's a bit of a drag, and there aren't really any tough battles, so we can move right past it. Honestly, this game needed more interesting battles when it came to Team Plasma, like some admins or something. Ent's cool, but he feels more like another rival than a part of Team Plasma. The battles here are just really plain with Team Plasma using the same Pokemon across all battles. Hey, I mean, if I'm going to criticize the Jota games over their Team Rocket sections every time I play them, Black and White shouldn't really get a pass either. At least climbing through a derelict castle with the dragon rampaging at the top is a lot more of an interesting set piece than tall building number four. And obviously this isn't the conclusion of the Team Plasma arc. But on the bright side, while this part may be a drag, you can stretch those fingers and move that cursor over to the subscribe button in the meantime. Maybe even try clicking it. Oh, we're not done yet? Don't worry, you can even click the like button to pass the time. Maybe even get some extra dopamine, which may or may not get sent to me instead. Wow, don't you feel alive? Onwards to the next gym, we had to fight Dragon Pokemon, and that is a type that's difficult to account for in a no-stab run. With Fairy not existing yet, the only types super effective against Dragon are Ice and Dragon itself. Good luck finding TMs for either of those. Dragon Claw is locked behind Victory Road, and the only Ice type TMs that we can get up until now are Frost Breath from Bryson, a move very few Pokemon can actually learn, literally only three lines during the main campaign, all of which being the Pokemon that Bryson used, and Blizzard which has an accuracy of 70%. I forgot that getting through this gym itself is actually kind of difficult. Many of the dragon types used by the gym trainers still hit hard with Stab Dragon Claw and a high base attack. The pseudo legendary lines also getting the ability Hustle, which boosts attack by 50% at the cost of accuracy. And you also can't really go back to heal until you get to the end. 
I actually came close to losing a few Pokemon here. But funnily enough, Drayden, while certainly not being a pushover, isn't as hard as many people might think because of a specific move. I did end up buying the TM for Blizzard and also Hail to complement it, as Blizzard is always accurate during Hail. Drayden leads with Fracture, the pre evo of Haxorus, and I sent out Semipaw, who I taught both of those TMs to. We set up a Hail turn 1 as Fracture uses a Dragon Dance, raising both attack and speed. This move is the main reason this gym can be terrifying, but whether it's poor game design or intentional to make the gym a little easier for some reason, all the dragon types here have the move Dragon Tail, which forces the target to switch out, but always moves last, obviously conflicting with the move that raises speed. This means that we can still outspeed and hit Blizzard for the one shot. The thing is that with Stab, they're almost always baited into using this move unless they have something to hit you for super effective damage. Next is Dragon, who we use another Blizzard on, doing just enough damage for it to survive after hail damage, and then it uses a boosted revenge since I attacked first, doing a lot of damage. Hill doesn't quite finish it off. Now this sucks because while we are able to outspeed and win the one on one regardless, Dredagon's in range for a heal, which also stores out turns of hail. I opt to use Bite this turn so I can skip the second potion finishing it off with Blizzard, but now just as the ace comes out, the hail subsides, which means Haxorus will likely be able to get off a free Dragon Dance whether we attack or switch. I want to play as safely as possible, so I stay in. Tao still being able to land the Blizzard, not quite doing enough damage for the kill, and Haxorus finishes him off with the Dragon Tail. That was our first death this run, and Tao went out with a bang. But with his sacrifice, I can safely bring out Soap, and as Drayden heals, we can set up a Swords Dance. Haxorus outspeeds to set up a Dragon Dance, but it was in vain as Soap uses a plus two return, landing the one shot and getting us the final badge. Losing Tal was sad as he was our only water type that actually got decent coverage moves, but with us finally in the end game with the level cap increasing, Gen 5's monster can finally fully evolve, ready to avenge his predecessor and take on the final challenge of the region, the Pokemon League. This Victory Road entrance is probably my favourite in the franchise. I love how each gate represents each gym that you force and how the music starts adding more instruments as you go through each one, with a massive imposing cliff standing in your way when you get to the end, hinting at the labyrinth that you're about to go through with a broken bridge on the left and a small gap between the gates on the right. I think that this is the first Victory Road that mixed outdoor sections with the interior ones. The actual content of the Victory Road however is a lot more bare. It's a cool dungeon don't get me wrong with optional paths to go through, but the direct part to the end takes about 5 to 10 minutes to go through once you know the way. You only need to fight like two force trainers. Still more than the Kanto and Joseph victory road though. So you can challenge the elite four members in any order that you want. I don't really have any hard rules for it, but I tend to fight them from hardest to easiest since you typically want more Pokemon for the harder ones. But if I see an easy sweep, then I figure I may as well fight them first. So our first one will be Chantel. She leads with Kofa Grigus, and I send out our brand new Pokemon, Scarf the Hexorus. As we saw with Drayden, she gets the special move Dragon Dance, which we use immediately. I was hoping Kofa would use Will-O-Wisp as I have a berry for burns, but it uses Shadow Ball instead, doing less than half. We can stay in for another dance as we get hit by another Shadow Ball. And now, Shadow Claw gets the one shot. Shadow Claw gets the one shot on Golurk. Shadow Claw gets the one shot on Chandelure. And Shadow Claw gets the one shot on Jellicent first member down. Next I go for Caitlyn, though I immediately realised that Grimsley would have been easier. Too late to turn back, so Caitlyn leaves with Reuniclus and we let our monster take charge. Reuniclus is fairly bulky, hits hard, and this one has some really strong moves. I'm not really convinced that we can one shot even after a dragon dance, so I attack immediately. That looks like it could have been a roll, so I'm glad that we played it safe. We take a psychic, doing well over half, and then lowers our special defence. Doesn't matter too much as we can finish it off the next turn. Next is Sigilyph, who is pretty fast and has Ice Beam. With the defense drop, we aren't staying in, so into Soap, as it uses a weak Psychic instead. Still doing a lot, actually. Based on that, we can survive two Ice Beams with our Berry, so I set up a Sword Stance. Get hit by one more Ice Beam and Shadow Claw. Mashana comes out, Shadow Claw, and finally it's got the tell. Shadow Claw. And that's Caitlyn. She's pretty straightforward once you get a boost off, but that starting Reuniclus certainly doesn't make that easy with this coverage. Now we can take care of Grimsley. Grimsley leaves with Scrafty and there's no stopping our demon. Set up two Dragon Dances as we two crunches, recovering back some HP with a berry. Crocodile lowers our attack, but it's frailer than Reuniclus, so I feel pretty safe staying in to pick up another one shot. Bishop is four times we to Brick Break, so I'm sorry, buddy. Grimsley, what are you doing with a Lipard? That's just embarrassing. 
Three down, one left to go. But unfortunately, this is the hardest out of the lot. Fighting is weak to two types in this generation, Psychic and Flying. The former doesn't have a single TM that we can get before the post game, and the latter barely has any Pokemon that can learn the TMs that we do get, especially out of the encounters that I've caught. And very few Pokemon outside of these typings can learn any Psychic or Flying moves naturally by level up. And to top it off, four of my Pokemon are also weak to fighting. Not the greatest planning on my part, but my other encounters weren't really much better, so we're coming into this battle at a disadvantage. Marshall leads with throw, and this time I bring out the evolved broccoli. We can probably survive a move, so I set up an attack boost with work up. Throw can hit hard with storm throw, which always crits, but since the AI doesn't take that into consideration, he uses stone edge instead which crits, leaving us on 9 HP anyway. Well, Storm Throw would have done more damage if Stone Edge didn't crit. We survived eating a berry, and Broccoli is one of the few Pokemon that does learn a flying move through level up. Acrobatics. This doubles in power if you're not holding an item, which we no longer are, basically acting as a 110 power flying move. A plus one, boosted super effective acrobatics gets us, that's all it does? Stone Edge once again hits, finishing Broccoli off. The second death of this run being yet another monkey. At least Hal went out swinging. I'm gonna be honest, while I was planning to sack him, I was expecting him to at least take down a couple with him. I think I vastly overestimated the monkeys after Sharon's one almost killed my mon. I bring out Scarf as it's our only other Pokemon not weak to fighting, and as Marshall uses a full restore, even Return doesn't do too much. Maybe Throw is just bulkier than I remember. Throw doesn't hit too hard without a crit, so we can set up two Dragon Dances, with Throw even using up a turn to use a much weaker Bulldoze, attempting to lower my speed. But one speed boost guarantees that we outspeed all of his mons. A plus two Return and finishes throw off. Sork has the ability Sturdy, allowing it to survive one hit KOs, but Hexorus has Mold Breaker, which bypasses that, one shotting with the return. Unfortunately, I don't see us one shotting Conkelda, but as all of our Pokemon are weak to fighting, I see no other option than to let Scarf's Rampage come to a rest. We use a plus to return, doing just about 75%, as Conkelda uses a stab hammer arm. Scarf surviving on 7 HP, an absolute titan of a Pokemon. I can't believe I was actually considering sacking you. Another return picks up the kill. Does anyone else remember Marshall's ace being Conkelder as well? Apparently it's Mian Chao, which I was actually taken aback by after seeing the level. It didn't even cross my mind when Conkelder was on the field. Anyway, with one speed boost, we can still outspeed, so a plus two return gets a final one shot. Haxorus has never been a disappointment in any of my runs. I think Marshall's consistently the one that gives me the most trouble during my challenge runs. Fighting is not an easy type to deal with without the existence of fairy types. Even even the types that resisted don't typically get many coverage moves, though I really should have brought at least one other Pokemon that was neutral against it. But a win's a win, and that's the Elite Four down. All that's left is the champion. If we weren't playing the peak generation. See, Pokemon Black and White go down a different route. Having an entire functional castle emerge through the ground as you think you're about to have the final battle. The climax not being the champion battle, but rather the conclusion of the Team Plasma arc. This being the only game where the gym leaders actually do something against the evil team. We can go through the castle learning more about N and his relationship with Getsis and Team Plasma, but the important part for us is that now we can restore our Pokemon to full health and even use a PC to replace the Pokemon that we lost. Which is why I'm not scared to sack Pokemon here. I'm sorry for saying that you're the inferior grass type this generation, Noodle. At the apex of the castle, N goes us into awakening our dragon so that we can battle on an even playing field. What a man. But unfortunately, the non-stab moves this half of the original dragon gets are not great. So, goodbye. The true final battle revealed to be against N, we face off against the other half of the original dragon, with a dragon and spirit. I think Zekrom is hardcoded to always use its signature move first, which Noodle resists, so we can safely set up a lead seed. Fusion Bolt's still doing quite a bit, but using that, we can gauge that Zekrom's Giga Impact will do about double the damage, meaning after recovering some HP with lead seed, we can set up a coil raising attack, defense, and accuracy to be safe. Zekrom uses a light screen anyway, and now since we have a lead seed to do passive damage, we can just spam Coil and this half of the original dragon can do absolutely nothing to us without a lucky crit. You know, I typically don't abuse these, but why not? We're on the final battle, and I admittedly chat a lot of shit about poor superior at the start. We use these next four turns to max out our attack and defense. And accuracy, I guess. By the time that we're done, Zekrom's HP is in the red and we're still at full health. N's gonna heal, so we use a plus six return, doing just a little over half. Okay, look, Pool Noodle's really trying here. Another one picks up the kill, but we're not done. N sends out Vanalux, return. N sends out Clink Clang, return. 
I'll ride that thing. And it actually sends out Kling Clang. It resists all of our moves, and for some reason, this one only has special moves despite being a physical attacker. I set up a Leech Seed as we can't kill, so we can at least recover some damage in the meantime. Spam Return as Kling Clang annoyingly uses a Hyper Beam, and that's Kling Clang down. Archeops resists Return and also has a super effective flying move, but Archeops has a sad ability where if its health falls below half HP, its attacking stat also falls by half. With our defense boosts, we easily tank the super effective acrobatics. Return finishes off Archeops, and finally it's Caracosta, and there really isn't much it can do. Stone Edge does have a chance to crit, but it finally misses for a change, and three returns bring him down. The Pokemon I claim to be the worst starter option, single-handedly defeating the champion figure of the game, one who uses a box legendary, and ending the- no, of course not. We haven't even fought the best villain yet, the true, true final battle of the game being against Getsus. His team probably being the most threatening out of all of the evil team bosses, but someone hasn't been able to satiate their bloodlust quite yet. And it isn't Getz's. Getz's leads with Cofagrigus, and we unfortunately didn't get a chance to switch around our Pokemon. Pool Noodle's done enough for this challenge, so I decided to just spam a few flashes, lowering Cough's accuracy until he gets poisoned by Toxic. Now, I was planning to sack Noodle here, setting up a lead seed and spamming a few more flashes in the meantime, but I got sentimental. After taking down a box legendary, he deserves a safe retirement. Having the self respect to not let another grass type be sacrificed for her, Scarf switches in on the Shadow Ball which misses. We've used about 4 flashes now, so we're pretty safe to set up a Dragon Dance on a Miss Toxic, and then another on a Shadow Ball which hits doing less than half, but then lowering our special defense. Now we can't afford to get hit once. A plus 2 super effective Shadow Claw finishes Cofagrigus off. Since Scarf's on the field, Getsus' Nightmare Fuel is baited into coming out early. This Hydreigon evolved 10 stages early, a step even further from Lance's illegal Dragonite, and has some insane coverage. It's usually faster, but we have a speed boost. A plus 2 super effective of Brick Break getting the one shot. Honestly, I would have been happy if this was the only thing Scarf was able to do. Left unchecked, Hydreigon could be a game ender. If not outright sweeping your whole team, at least doing well enough damage for the rest to finish up. But now with the main threat out of the way, there's only a couple of Pokemon left that we have an advantage over. Buffalon being one of them. A plus two Brick Break gets another one shot. However, Seismitoad is chonky enough to eat a return, so we're forced to tank an Earthquake before finishing him off with another return. Or two more after the heal. Two more left, but for some reason Getsa sends out Bisharp, despite seeing me use Brick Break multiple times. A move that we've established Bisharp is four times weak to. Brick Break. And finally, it's Electros. This is a Pokemon with no weaknesses thanks to having the ability Levitate, making it immune to ground moves. Something Scarf could have bypassed with their ability Mold Breaker, but unfortunately we didn't have enough move slots for Dig. I could switch out here for another Pokemon to get a Deathless battle, but is that what Scarf would want? After wreaking havoc among Gessis' ranks, she would rather die a hero's death than be caught turning her back towards the enemy. She stays in to use a return, just missing the kill. And Electros uses Flamethrower for some reason. Scarf surviving on just 7 HP yet again. A final return finishes off Electros, ending Gessis' career and the Nuzlocke. Holy fuck, Scarf. I said something about the Axew line being one of my favorite dragon lines. Scratch that. It is my favorite dragon line. Him alongside Excadrill are some of the most consistent Pokemon I've had throughout my history of Pokemon Challenge runs, always ending up being pretty prominent members of my team in whichever section I get them. Pokemon Black certainly had a lot of changes over Pokemon Platinum, and somehow despite TMs now being unlimited, I actually found it to be slightly harder than Platinum. I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that we're relying on physical move TMs, and that the elemental special move TMs are locked behind the post game, whereas in Platinum you can get them by the 4th gym, and a lot of Pokemon can learn them. But the other factor was that surprisingly, a lot of Pokemon in this game don't really get great level up moves, and this includes Stab. This surprised me as Gen 5 has some of the hardest hitters when it comes to Pokemon, even to this day, so I guess I've just assumed that most of them were busted, but nope, more than plenty of terrible Pokemon too. Like every generation. What other games do you think this sort of challenge would be interesting in? And how do you think the opposite of this, a stab only challenge would go? Let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed the video, please consider liking and subscribing, and I hope you look forward to more videos in the future.